Hey, Jeff here. And it's Ray. And so uh, we're taking uh, a couple weeks off here in the summer, but still wanted to leave you with uh, with some episodes to ponder. Yeah, this is very odd for us to take this time off, but it's, we don't we, do it's it a lot. needed. It's needed. We don't yeah. do it a lot. But we're not going to leave you stranded. We want no. to uh, present you with some of our favorite episodes. From the vault. Now, we've had some wild stories from the lumber camps of Maine, uh, and I guess, you know, easy to imagine you're out there for weeks, maybe months in the woods of Maine, just dropping trees all day. And maybe you start to see things, Ray. We just kind of talked about this on the last podcast. You, you concentrate a little too hard. You're doing the same thing over and over. You start to see things. Yeah. And maybe those strange things could explain unusual accidents. Anyway, so this is Three Strange Beasts from the Woods of Maine. And it originally aired March 5th, 2020. Timber! Oh, man. Hey, it's good to be back up here in the woods of Western Maine, Ray. Oh, I agree. The clean air, the honest, manly work. Yeah, nothing makes you feel quite like a man than knocking down giant trees. <laughs> Heads up! Whoa! Oh, thank you. That was close. Yeah, Jeff, I love that we're miles from civilization, too. Sure. I mean, this is what this part of Maine looked like centuries ago, and it still feels untouched. It does. But being this remote is also, you know, a little bit scary. I mean, we don't exactly know what strange beasts may be lurking in the dark forest all around us. What was that? (laughs) I have no idea. But I hope it's not one of the three legendary monsters said to torment the loggers of Maine. Because today... We're looking for the Agropelter, the Bildad, and the Tote Road Shagamaw. Hello, I'm Jeff Belanger, and welcome to episode 133 of the New England Legends podcast. If you give us about 10 minutes, we'll give you something strange to talk about today. And I'm Ray Osher. Thanks for camping out with us as we document every single legend in New England, one story at a time. Think of us as your modern-day Brothers Grimm. Our episode this week is brought to you by our Patreon patrons. Thank this you. This is a growing army of people who kick in just three bucks per month because they believe in what we're doing. They know great things happen when we share these stories. Plus, they get early access to new episodes and bonus episodes that nobody else gets to hear. If you want to become an even bigger part of the family, head over to patreon.com slash New England Legends to sign up. And speaking of family, we love hearing from you guys. We do. Whether you call or text our legend line anytime at 617-444-9683, or if you join our super secret Facebook group, a lot of story leads come from you guys. Like this week. Thanks to Mike Adamovic for tipping us off with these strange beasts in the woods of Maine. And this isn't the first time we've tracked strange creatures in Maine. No, it isn't. We hunted the spectral moose of Lobster Lake back in episode 64. Right. And old razor shins in episode 50. That's right, yeah. But this time we're searching for three different creatures. Most of what we know about these legends comes from the 1910 book Fearsome Creatures of the Lumberwoods by William T. Cox. So... With that in mind, we're going to head to a remote logging camp in western Maine, near the small town of Skinner, to the very heyday of logging. It's 1805, and here we are in the woods of Maine, and it's busy. This new nation, called the United States, needs lumber to build houses, businesses, and mighty ships, so the northeast turns to Maine for wood. Logging camps are springing up all over as men fell trees all day long, and then they camp in the woods at night. They stay up here for weeks at a time. As daylight turns to darkness, the loggers find themselves sitting around a campfire, cooking their suppers and telling stories of the strange things they've seen and heard about in the woods. You can't blame them for spinning yarns and comparing scars. Now, some of these tales are funny, but some involve creatures unlike anything you've ever heard about before. Listen, it looks like old Red over there is about to tell us about the agropelter. Leading a a vengeful existence and resenting the intrusion of the logger, the agropelter deals misery to the lumberjack from Maine all the way to Oregon. Ill fares the man who attempts to pass a hollow tree in which one of these creatures has, has taken up its temporary abode. The unfortunate is usually found smashed or pinned by a dead branch and reported as having been killed by a falling limb. So unnerving is the aim of the agropelter that despite diligent search, I have been unable to locate more than just one man who has been the target for for one of the missiles and yet survived to describe the beast. This big old Lay Kittleson, who, upon a certain occasion, when cruising timber on the Penobscot River, was knocked down by a partly rotten limb, 
thrown by an agripelter. This limb was so punky that it shattered on Ole's head, and, and he had time to observe the rascally beast before it bounded from the tree and whisked itself off through, through the woods. Now, according to Ole, the, the animal was slender, wiry body, the villainous face of an ape, and, and arms like muscular whiplashes with which it can snap off dead branches and hurl them through the air like shells from a six-inch gun. It's supposed to feed upon hoot owls and woodpeckers, the scarcity of which will always prevent the agropelter from becoming numerous in, in any locality. Okay. So some ape-like creature <laughs> is hiding in hollow trees and crushing unsuspecting loggers with giant branches? Yeah, that's what it sounds like. I can imagine finding a logger crushed by a branch is something the men of the camp have encountered now and again. And I'm sure they have to wonder if it's just bad luck, an accident, or, you know, maybe it's the agropelter. Well, do you think this could be the case of assigning some monster to what is otherwise just an accident? It could be. It could totally be that. But sometimes these guys, they seem so sure of these stories they're telling. Oh, look, I see Big Jim over there twitching just a bit. <laughs> yeah, he is. He was telling me a little earlier about the strangest creature I've ever heard of. He called it a Bildad. If you have ever paddled around Bondary Pond in northwest Maine, at night you have probably heard from out the black depths of a cove a spat like a paddle striking the water. It may have been a paddle, but the chances are ten to one that it was a bildad fishing. This animal occurs only on this one pond in Hurricane Township. It's about the size of a beaver, has long kangaroo-like hind legs, short front legs, webbed feet, and a heavy hawk-like bill. Its mode of fishing is to crouch on a grassy point overlooking the water, and when a trout rises for a bug to leap with amazing swiftness just to pass the fish, bringing its heavy flat tail down with a resounding smack over him. This stuns the fish, which is immediately picked up and eaten by the Bildad. It has been reported that 60 yards is a average jump for an adult male. Up to three years ago, the opinion was current among lumberjacks that the Bildad was fine eaten. But since the beasts are exceedingly shy and hard to catch, no one was able to remember having tasted the meat. That fall, one was killed in Boundary Pond and brought into the Great Northern Paper Company's camp on Hurricane Lake, where the cook made a most savory slum gullion of it. The first and only man to taste it was Bill Murphy, a tow road swamper from Ambajagus. After the first mouthful, his body stiffened, his eyes glazed, and his hands clutched the table edge. With a wild yell, he rushed out of the cookhouse, down to the lake, and leaped clear out fifty yards, coming down in a sitting posture, exactly like a bill dead catching a fish. Of course, he sank like a stone. Since then, not a lumberjack in Maine will touch Bill Dad meat. Not even with a pike pole. Oh, come on. <laughs> I don't know. It feels like these tales are getting taller by the minute, Jeff. Yeah, yeah. Almost like these guys are trying to outdo each other. I'm sure there's some of that going on. Oh, man. Hey, check out the smile on Old Blue's <laughs> face over there. Hey, Blue, tell us about that tote road shagamaw. From the Rangeley Lakes to the Allagash and across in New Brunswick... Loggers tell of an animal which has puzzled many a man, even those who are not strangers in the woods. Frequently, the report has circulated that the tracks of a bear have been seen near camp, but a little later this is denied and moose tracks are reported instead. Heated arguments among the men, sometimes resulting in fistfights, are likely to follow. It is rightly considered an insult to a woodsman to accuse him of not being able to distinguish the track of either of these animals, to only a few of the old timber cruisers and rivermen is the explanation of these changing tracks known. Gus Demo of Old Town, Maine, who has hunted and trapped and logged in the Maine woods for 40 years, once came upon what he recognized as the tracks of a moose. After following it for about 80 rods, it changed abruptly into unmistakable bear tracks. Another 80 rods and it changed to moose tracks again. It was soon observed by Mr. Demo that these changes took place precisely every quarter of a mile, and furthermore, that whatever was making the tracks always followed a tote road or a blaze line through the woods. 
Coming up within sight of the animal, Gus saw that it had front feet like a bear's and hind feet like those of a moose, and that it was pacing carefully, taking exactly a yard at a step. Suddenly it stopped and looked all about and swung us on a pivot, then inverting itself and walking on its front feet only, it resumed its pacing. Mr. Demo was only an instant in recognizing by the witness trees that the place where the animal changed was a section corner. From this fact, he reasoned that the Shagamaw must have been originally a very imitative animal, which from watching surveyors, timber cruisers, and trappers patiently followed lines through the woods, contracted the habit itself. He figures that the Shagamaw can count only as high as 440, therefore it must invert itself every quarter of a mile. All right, right, listen, this is all I can take of these tall tales. (laughs) And that brings us back to today. Okay, I, I get it. You spend weeks out here in the woods chopping wood all day. Right. You sit around the campfire at night and have to keep yourselves entertained. I get that. Yep. So you start spreading these stories that you've heard. But there's just enough truth in these tales, some little tiny piece that makes you wonder, is there something more to it? Well, you, but in the case of the agripelter, I, I get it. Loggers do indeed die if a giant limb falls on top of them or if the tree doesn't land quite so well. So, Ray, I've been known to take down a tree or two with my mighty chainsaw. Okay. The funny thing about falling a tree is that it happens kind of slowly. Now, as you cut through it, it starts to crack, and then it breaks. Then it takes a second or two to actually fall. And you get a pretty good sense of which direction it's falling if you do it right. The only way you can get hurt, pretty much, is if you're not paying attention. Or, say, if I'm chopping down a tree nearby and get so caught up in my own chopping that I don't hear you yell timber. Right, okay. And the next thing you know... I'm crushed. And instead of me taking accountability for the accident, I spread the story of the agripelter and the legend grows. Right, right, right. I I have to say, though, the Bildad was my personal favorite. (laughs) Right. Eat the thing and you hop like a mighty frog. (laughs) And again, we're out here in these isolated woods. We see these odd critters and we long for more interesting foods than the lame provisions of the camp. So, of course, we're going to wonder, well, hey, what would happen if you cooked one of those strange forest creatures? And the lesson of the Bildad is, well, you really shouldn't eat any random animal you find. <laughs> That's true. And this story's so specific. I mean, Boundary Pond. Nowhere else, as far as we know. So if you ever find yourself out there and you know the story, you can't help but wonder if there's some high-jumping unknown creature on the border of the U.S. and Canada. And what about the Tote Road Shagamaw? Yeah. A, a creature that can only count to 440 before switching <laughs> the way it walks? I mean, come on. I know, I know. Think about the fights that would start between loggers arguing over someone who can't tell the difference between a moose track and a bear track, yeah. right? Now, if a creature's out there that can make both tracks, well, that would settle a lot of arguments and keep a little peace in the logging camps. All right. So each story serves its purpose. And makes us wonder just a little bit when we're way out here in the remote woods of western Maine, what strange things may be lurking nearby? Yeah, I think we should get going, Jeff. Yeah. I've seen what happens to guys who spend too long out in the woods. You get nicknames like Old Blue and Old Red, and the next thing you know, some wild beast is throwing trees at you as it hops around on bear and moose feet. <laughs> and with that, you may have just given birth to the agro bildad Shagama. I guess it's a story for another day. Exactly. Just a reminder that the discussion about the story continues on our Patreon page in the extras. Head to patreon.com slash New England Legends, where we go more in-depth about each episode. And if you enjoy these stories each week, please do post a review or tell a friend or two about us. We'd like to thank Tim Ellis from the Creaking Door podcast, Michael Leggy, and Tim Weisberg from Midnight in the Desert, all for lending their voice acting talents this week. And our theme music is by John Judd. Hi, this is Lori Bastian from Pembroke, Massachusetts. Until next time, remember, the bazaar is closer than you think. 